There we go. Now we are. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, uh, thank you everybody for attending. Uh, the, the response has just been tremendous. And I definitely like to um, first start by thanking Eileen for all of the the work that she's done to, to put this together. It's been really great. I came to her uh, a while back with the idea, hey, let's let's do something for trainees. And she really ran with it. And I think it's um, it's going to be a really useful session with a lot of uh, really great speakers today. So uh, thank you for the uh, speakers and the, the time and effort you're putting into this. And thank you, Eileen, for um, all the hard work you, you've done on this. So I'm going to share my screen and fingers crossed it will work. Um, I just wanted to very briefly just mention CF Canada's. Paul, um, your audio has dropped out. Uh-oh. There we go. Now you're back. Oh, I, uh, apologies. I don't know what happened, but glad I'm back. Um, so I just wanted to very briefly uh, mention CF Canada's um, awards competition. In the past, we have funded graduate students. Right now, that funding is being paused. Um, but we do hope that it will come back at some point in the future. But we are funding uh, research fellowships through CF Canada. Um, and I've got some details on the screen here. I don't want to belabor this, but uh, it's a $40,000 salary award for people who have completed a, a PhD or an MD degree and are doing uh, laboratory research. And for this year, we've added a $3,000 stipend as well to use for travel or, or some other research expenses. And so you can see the details here. Um, it's for Canadian applicants at Canadian institutions. However, uh, with justification and approval, uh, a limited number of Canadian applicants can hold one of these fellowships outside of Canada. And also, foreign applicants in Canada at a Canadian institution may apply as well. And you can apply on Proposal Central. And if you go to the CF Canada website, um, you can find the links to more information and uh, to the application on Proposal Central. And our deadline is October 1st, so coming up quickly. Um, so thank you very much for allowing me to do that. Um, I'm just going to show this slide here. It's the same code, same QR code as Eileen shared before. Um, so if you scan this code with your smartphone, for example, or enter this code here at slido.com, you can open up um, the active poll for questions. And if you have questions for the speaker, feel free to enter them at any time and um, we'll be sure to go through as many as possible at the end. So I'll stop sharing my screen now, but the poll will remain active throughout and I may put it back up on the screen at various uh, time points. Um, so I'll pass it back to Eileen to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Tilly Hackett from the University of British Columbia. I will get your slide started. Perfect, thank you. Okay, you can see your okay. slide. Yes, I can. I hope everyone else can too. So good morning, everyone. Nice to meet you all here. I'm glad you can join the workshop. Um, I was asked to provide the the experience of the reviewer and I can say that I've been a reviewer for the Canadian Lung Association and for CHR for fellowships for a long time. Um, I have had not had the pleasure of doing it for the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation but I hope that this will be a, very applicable to um, their fellowships too from what I've looked at their scoring. So um, from my training I trained in the UK as my PhD but I did all of my postdoctoral fellowship and early career investigator and position here in Canada. So although I haven't applied for the PhD training before, I can also give you my perspective of having written these applications as a postdoctoral fellow as well. So if you could advance to the next slide, please. Thank you. So especially when you're a trainee, a lot of us see the reviewer as like kind of the bad guy, right? They're the guy that's, that's judging us. But please remember that the reviewer is asked to evaluate you as a trainee and your potential to be successful within the environment. So that's with your supervisor and the project that you're proposing. So you know, th this is the, their, their role. Um, 
there are a few limitations of the reviewers that we, we need to take in consideration when we are writing applications. So the reviewer is a time restrained person. You know, they are asked by the foundations and by CHR to review applications. And they honestly have to do this outside of their normal working hours. We're either teaching or with our lab. So they're generally doing this between meetings or in the evenings or on the weekend. And on average, the reviewer will be given six to 10 applications to review. Um, and this is actually a good thing because it enables the reviewer then to see within a peer group how the applications differ. If you could hit the, the next point, please, Helene. Um, the reviewer is a senior person, but as I've explained with my training, you know, they have gone through the process themselves and they, you know, they understand that this is a hard process obtaining funding for yourself to pursue your career, it, you know, it, it's, it's a challenge. So please be aware that they are aware of the process and all the hardships of grad school. I think the biggest um, limitation that we have to, as trainees, accept as the reviewer is that they are potentially a non-expert reviewer for your specific research. We would all be respiratory research uh, investigators. Uh, we may have expertise on molecular work, we may have expertise in imaging or in genomics, but we may not be an expert in your specific molecule or protocol that you're using. So one thing I would stress through all your applications um, as a grad student, a fellow, and even as a new investigator, is please think about making your application almost written not in lay language but in clear and concise language that anyone could any respiratory researcher would be able to read and that really does play a role in how successful applications are in the review process okay next slide please so first of all i wanted to go through the actual review process to give you an idea of what happens um, as a trainee, I, you know, I had no idea how these applications were reviewed, and only when I became a reviewer myself did I understand what was actually being assessed and, and what is the reviewer looking for. So the first phase is where the reviewer actually gets to read your application, okay, and they're judge, scoring those applications compared to other applicants. So here I've put the scoring range that is given by the Canadian Lung Association, but this is also a very similar range for um, CHR. Now the reviewers are asked to judge, sorry, not evaluate on several different points, how you range um, with these range descriptors. And I, I'm gonna go through each of the sections and give you um, ideas of what the reviewer is looking for each point in a second, but I, I just wanted to put out the scoring here. This last point at the end, the Canadian Lung Association also have an overall weighted score, okay? So you'll be rated by this range, and then there is this additional component of the overall weighted score where th that score is then multiplied by a factor depending on how important it is seen in the application. So this happens at the Canadian Lung Association. Um, this does not happen with the CHR scoring. And we'll see how the scoring looks for each section of the application in a second. So we'll, we'll go through that. Okay, so next slide, please. Now, once the reviewers have reviewed the applications, they are then submitted back to the CF um, Canada or Canadian Lung Association or CHR. And then the, the personnel there will assess the applications. And then there is normally a 50% cutoff given. So at this point, applications that don't meet the 50% quartile would not be reviewed any further. So you'll be given back the feedback from the reviewers, but they won't be discussed any further. For those that are 50% or higher, if we go to the next point, please, then there is normally a, a telephone conference call, or in some cases, this used to be done in person before COVID, where these applications are then reviewed. Okay, so during this process, the primary reviewer will give a brief summary of your application. So actually, you know, they have to write and also then give an oral presentation on, on what was your application? Who are you? What do you want to do? Who are you training with? So that, you know, they actually really have to understand your application. And then they will give the score that they gave the applicant and the application. The secondary reviewer, 
will then also give their their points on their their ranking they won't give another summary but they'll give they'll touch on any other information that they think that the primary reviewer may have missed or where they maybe have different um, opinions in the ranking the application is then opened up and all committee members can actually provide any input or questions for clarification on the application so it's actually very in-depth reviewed. And this is exactly how, you know, postdoctoral fellowships and grant applications are discussed as well in the review process. So it's, it's a very similar process. Um, at the end of that discussion, the primary and secondary reviewers will then agree on a consensus score. And that is the final score for the application. Okay. And, and then at the end of that meeting, when the <clears throat> sorry, the applicants are ranked in their scoring, and then this is submitted back to the, the trainee. You will receive all of those reviewer comments, but you'll also receive any scientific officer comments. So this is the person in the meeting who's actually taking down notes of all of these discussions and any, you know, important points that they think are important for the application, and then they're provided to the applicant. So it is quite an in-depth um, process. So next, I'd like to go through the specific sections that the reviewer is actually asked to um, assess um, the trainee um, application on. So the first point is the applicant's background. And as you can see, I've, I've put in the textbook exactly what we are given to rate. Um, and you'll see on the right, there's the reviewer's rating out of 4.9. And then you'll also see this weighted result. So this, this is this um, additional scoring that is done specifically at the Canadian Lung Association. So as we go through, you'll see that number on the right, some are larger than others. So some are, are considered given greater weight for being the importance of rating the application. Now, in terms of your CV, this is really, you know, at this point, you've all done so well, right? You've all here, you've got your undergraduate degree, you all really want to do some future research in science, right? So um, unfortunately, you're kind of all at the same level here, right? So it, it's, it's quite hard to distinguish people at this point on their CV. So what I want to clarify is, is really what the reviewers are looking and maybe additional little points that you can add. So apart from just your degree, you know, really distinguish yourself. Make sure that any academic distinctions, like being on the, the honors list or awards, um, maybe that was a, a research presentation award or anything that, or fellowship that you received during your undergraduate, make sure they're on your CV. Additionally, if you've done any summer uh, positions in labs, if you've had any co-op terms, make sure that research experience is listed there. And I, I think another big thing that a lot of people maybe forget to add is, you know, really add any experience you've had with volunteering, mentoring, or involvement in scientific committees, you know, were you on part of a student body, you know, how involved have you been in research? And this really helps to enable us to distinguish candidates on their CV. Okay, thank you, next slide. Okay, so the next important part is the applicant's plan. So this is, you know, that piece where you're really going to tell the reviewer why you want to do this research. Um, so again, I would say there's mainly three parts to this. The introduction would really be explain to me what has been your previous training and, and why do you want to move forward in, in this, right? So I, that's what the review is really looking for. What has led you to this project to date, okay? The, the applicant's plan is also a really great point if there have, if you've had any career interruptions or if, you know, things just haven't gone how you expected, this is where you can really explain those um, compared to your CV where it's just, you know, listing the dates and positions. So this is a really good place where you can add that information to help the reviewer understand your training to date. The other thing I think this section is really great is, is what will this fellowship enable me? So if you try and think for yourself, you know, what are the top three things this fellowship is going to enable me to achieve? You know, one, is it going to enable my training to become an independent researcher right that that's like kind of top of my list but you may also want to talk about that you've been working in this field and you really want to follow your training in respiratory research and why 
Okay, and then I'll leave the third for you to decide. But again, think about how you're really going to explain to the reviewer. And it's great to maybe think of three things. Why you, why you really want this fellowship. Okay, and the last section of this plan, I think is really important, is to explain why you've chosen your current supervisor. What is it that they do that excites you? And once you get to you into the lab every day, right? What is it about the research environment that is gonna um, forward your training? So I think these are the key things that we really wanna see in the applicant's plan. Okay, the next section we're asked to review is, is publications. And here you'll see from the weighted result, that's a little bit higher and that's 19.6, um, okay? Now, publications is a, is a really tricky thing, right? Um, if any of you have been involved in a publication already, you'll know that, you know, this is a really hard point of the research to achieve, right? You do all the hard work in the lab. Then you, you do the hard work of writing this, editing this, going through the review process. So really a publication really identifies to the reviewer your expertise and able to, you know, to finish the project and translate this knowledge. And that's why they're deemed as such an important, you know, weighted um, uh, thing that we can evaluate trainees on. Now, the one pet peeve that I always see in the review process and that can damage how an application may succeed is how well and how clear the publications are listed. Um, some people don't do a very good job of distinguishing what is peer reviewed and published, as I've listed here, or what may be submitted or what may be an abstract. And that can really limit the application because often the reviewer will go on PubMed or, and look at the CV and see, and see was, was this correct? So please be clear with your publications. Um, I believe, you know, if you have something that is submitted or under review, be clear and add the submission code or the review um, revision code that you've been given and the dates to make it clear how far along you are in that publication process. And again, be very clear when you when you have abstracts that they are a different thing um, compared to a peer reviewed and published article. Okay, next slide, please. So the proposed research project, and this is probably one of the, the biggest items as we'll see by this weighted score of 29.4. You know, this is where you really get to tell the reviewer what you want to do, okay? And this is, this is why you're gonna get the money, right? So this is a very important uh, part of the proposals for all foundations and grants and fellowships. Um, now, again, remember the reviewer, take them as a lay reviewer. They will be working in the respiratory research field, but they will not be an expert. So when a grant or application is full with abbreviations, it becomes very hard for a reviewer to read through that and to understand it. So make sure it's a very a readable research hypothesis. Share it with your friends, share it with your colleagues, share it with people. You know, do can they can they read it? You know, even if they're working in the lung field, can they read your research proposal? Now, there's um, in terms of the proposal, you know, for most of you, you will be entering a lab. And so the research question will most likely be, be derived from previous um, research done in the lab. So what your uh, supervisor has been working on or what a previous grad student has been um, pursuing um, or even a funded grant proposal, okay? So I think, you know, the research proposal is often a very important point for the applicant to communicate with their supervisor and make sure that their research hypothesis is focused. Um, one thing I will see is that maybe applicants that are not yet in the lab, um, there maybe has not been much communication between them and the supervisor. And so often the, the hypothesis and the reasoning for why they would want to do the study is not always clear. So I, I recommend, especially for most of you, as you're going to be trying to get this award to join a lab, like make sure you spend the time to um, interact with the supervisor and make sure the, the hypothesis of the project is clear. I talked through um, lay and simple. And the, the last point I'd really like to highlight on this is that there, there are formatting guidelines provided by the foundations and CHR. And another you know, thing that comes up even in, in CHR operating grants is that when people misuse the rules, 
and use smaller font and do, you know what do we do with this and and is it unfair to enable someone to have you know font size eight and get more text in there so people really do the reviewers are really asked to adhere to the formatting guidelines and that we will have to review the proposal on that so please um, keep keep to the formatting guidelines okay next part so okay i wanted to um go through this proposed research project a little bit more um, with specifics that um, will maybe help enhance your research project and help ensure for the reviewer that you know you're ready to do this research um, now for all of the projects you know it's good to start with an introduction right and so here you really want to introduce your research project in light of other published research right so what do we know previously about what you want to study, and then why is what you're studying gonna help improve that, right? That, that's really what you wanna base your introduction on. Um, and then obviously from that will come the hypothesis, you know, what do you propose to study and how will you answer that question, right? This is what the hypothesis is really um, derived for, right? What, what is the question you're gonna ask? So if we can advance. Okay, now depending where you're applying to and the length of the project, the number of aims in a research proposal will change, right? Obviously it's a one year or two year or three year. What you can do and achieve will, will, will change, right? So really try and you know set your aims. And I think it's really nice to have you know two or three aims depending on the project length. Set them as really realistic goals. Like what will I be able to achieve in the timeline of the fellowship? Um, within each aim, um, there is the potential to provide, you know, any preliminary data that has been done within the lab or by yourself that can help the reviewer understand, you know, where you are and why you want to achieve that aim. And I would also suggest that, you know, a picture can say a thousand words, okay? So it's also, you know, it's, it's possible to add um, images or data into these um, research projects um, and they can really help the reviewer understand um, you know preliminary work that would help them understand why you want to do this um, in terms of the methods you know again this section you really want to be clear you know what are you going to do and what is the data and how is it going to be assessed right what is the end number of the experiments what what are the previous statistics how did you determine the end number you know these are really important um, clarification points for the reviewer to understand how you will assess the data I think in very well drafted applications one thing we see a lot is at the end of each aim, um, the applicants are quite clear, maybe just in a sentence, is they often write, what are their expected outcomes? What, what do they hope to achieve at the end of the aim? And we may also see um, potential pitfalls. So if something doesn't work out, how may you address this? So this is what is often I see in very well developed research projects that um, maybe have even gone through the review process once, but you know, this is the type of um, information that is provided to the reviewer to really demonstrate that they understand what they're gonna do and that you know, this is what they're hoping to achieve. And then lastly, I think you know, with all research projects and grants, it's really nice to end with, you know, after you've done all this work, what is its importance, right? What are your main things that you hope to achieve at the end? And you know, how is this going to add to your to your field of interest? So I think that's a really nice point to end on to, to put into perspective for the reviewer what your project will achieve. Okay, next slide. So the next section that we're asked to assess for all is the assessment of the sponsor. Okay. Now so these are the reference letters that you're asked to get ahead of time. Now, I can I can really stress to you that the you know the worst thing you really want is a generic letter from your sponsors. You know, and a generic letter would be, well, I, I know this person for this how many years and I did this teaching, and you know, it, it doesn't really provide the reviewer any specifics of how they can assess your characteristics and abilities. Um, so I really strongly suggest with this, you know, plan ahead. 
Um, make sure your, your sponsor or your reference has enough time to really develop and write uh, a supporting letter for you. Um, and as well as updating them with your CV, you know, I think it's absolutely important, you know, you can yourself provide them examples of your achievements, you know, they may not pick them all out from your CV or they may not be on there. So to so make sure that you provide your, your sponsors and referees enough time and information to help them um, really develop a letter for you. Okay, so the next one is the training environment. Um, and so this is really an assessment of your mentor and the training that you will receive in the, in the environment that you will be placed in, in the institution or the, the research center. Now, in terms of the, your mentor, um, obviously once you've chosen your mentor, you know, they're, they're really gonna be assessed by their peers for their previous funding and supervisor experience. So as a trainee, there's not much you can, you can change with that, um, but you know, this section is primarily about your mentor. So make sure that they attach their CV and all information is included. Um, but you know, one thing that you, you can um, work on and adapt for these applications is a training plan. You know, in terms of your institution or research center, what other training do they provide? Is there, is there um, student bodies? Is there conferences held in the research center? Do they have any knowledge translation um, workshops? you know, really, truly really try and emphasize through the training plan, what else will be given to you as a trainee. And this is really important because these are the additional things that actually help you, you know, do well through your fellowship and be successful. Okay, so we're getting to the end. So, you know, you've done all this work, right? You've worked really hard on this application and you submit it and it gets rejected. And, you know, you're just like, why, you know, I put my heart into this. Um, you know, please remember, I mean, there's, there is limited funding, right? So there's only so many applications that can get funded and, and often at the top, it, it's really, really close. So I, I want to give you three things. We're in research. So here's three re's that I also tell myself and my students when we get a rejection, because unfortunately, this becomes a bit of the process. So the first thing I say to myself and my students is relax. Okay, I read it and then I, I just put it away. I put it somewhere else or close the email. And I normally give myself two days before I actually read the reviewers' comments again, okay? Um, and then I, then after two days, I probably have some clarity that I can actually review, re, re, read those comments again and really actually get some free advice, right? They may have provided a very good point, like my method may have been wrong or I may not have added. So to so take that free advice and, and use it and revise your application. And so the last point I'd say is resubmit. You know, if you are really close, that means that the applicants who were above you, they got the fellowship. And so next year they won't be in the competition. So, but I see a lot of, I have seen a lot of trainees through my uh, life that, you know, they don't resubmit because, you know, they just felt that rejection, but, you know, take the other opportunity and, and try again, please. Okay, so hopefully you'll be feeling uh, this <laughs> at some point when you submit application and your application will get accepted and so you know when you when this happens you know bask in the glory right you you've been doing a great job you've written a great application you're doing great research so make sure to tell your department and research center and let them you know translate that knowledge and get that out to to everyone um it's also the last chance for you to look at the reviewers' comments and see if there was anything that they suggested that may actually help your project, right? It, again, it's free advice and you could change this and make alterations before you start your project, okay? And the last thing is to remember is with the fellowships, after they've gone through half of the term, you have to submit an update. Um, so make sure you do this so you get the second half of payment. So with that, I'd like to end and I'd wish to wish you good luck in all your applications and hope this this information and, and from everyone that will come after me on this um, session will will help you get there. Thank you, Dr. Hackett. That was that was very thorough and uh, fantastic advice for everybody. Um, I'd like to call on our next speaker. That is uh, Matthew. Yeah, hi. Share my screen. There you go. 
go. Should be able to see my presentation, right? Awesome. Yes. Yeah. Great. So um, today I was asked to talk to you about grantmanship. So not necessarily just about how to put together a scholarship, but more like a grant, a research grant um, being, are you a PI or postdoc or a grad student? Maybe you'll be involved in this. Um, so honestly, grantmanship, it, it really feels like working in sales. Uh, you're not selling a car or houses, uh, you're selling your science, right? And you have to be a great seller when you're a scientist, unless you don't have a lab, right? So to me, it really feels like peer review is probably the toughest thing a researcher will have to go through. Um, you will likely experience frustration, anger, sometimes despair. Uh, but if you're humble and willing to improve, which means you have to not be too stubborn, you can be a bit stubborn, but not too much, uh, you will likely grow as a researcher, as a scientist, and as a person as well, right? So personally, I've been involved in over the past seven years, uh, I've been involved in over 40 peer review committees. Uh, I, I enjoy reviewing uh, grants. Uh, I love writing grants as well. Um, but I reviewed for a bunch of, of organizations being uh, local at my university or research center, provincial, um, national and international um, agencies as well. So I have quite a bit of experience for my age with regard to peer review. Uh, and, and honestly, without all that experience, I don't think I would be as successful as I am right now uh, because I learned a lot uh, through the process. So um, how do you write a grant? The first thing to do if you start writing a grant or if you tackle a grant and start writing right away, uh, you're not doing the right thing. You have to prepare and reflect. This is the first thing you have to do. Uh, you have to think, right? You're a researcher, think first. So before before even writing a, a sentence and, and i'm saying this and months before submission deadline ideally right personally I'll, i i i'm somebody who loves to uh be uh to work ahead so uh, i work in advance quite a bit i start thinking about a grant months and months um before so i tell myself do i know the story i want to tell right and people love um, to read stories uh, or to be told stories, right? Um, we're like that when we're kids, we still are. So as uh, a grant writer, when you're writing your application, it needs to feel like you're writing a story. What do you want to do? Uh, second, will my application fit in the funding competition? Well, that makes sense, right? Uh, if you have a project in your head and, and you read the guidelines, it, it doesn't really seem to fit well, this, this will influence the, your success rate for sure, right? Uh, who will be reviewing my application? And to me, I think this is the most important. Um, Tilly talked about it. You will not, you, you're not talking to yourself. You're not writing for yourself. If, if you understand your grant, honestly, and everything you, you've put in there, it doesn't matter because you will not be the reviewer. You're the applicant, right? So you will likely need to uh, write for Maybe if you're a PG, you need that. Maybe a physician will read your, your application. So if you go too much in details in the basic science, maybe the reviewer will not enjoy it necessarily. So think ahead, know, call the organizations who are part of the, 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 the review panel, who's invited usually, and this will give you some information, what kind of language to use in your application. Um, will your application be competitive? So this is a bit, a bit harder. You need a bit more experience uh, or to talk to people with experience. But um, right now, let's say that CIHR, applying for CIHR, it's highly competitive, right? So your grant has to be competitive. So if you don't feel that your grant will be competitive enough, maybe it's not the right time to apply. Maybe spend the next six months working, generating more data and making it more competitive. And try to find weaknesses and address them before submission, right? This seems to be obvious, but again, I'm seeing that months before submission. If you have a story in your head, you have a couple of goals you wanna achieve, and a couple of aims you wanna put in there. Um, if you already find some weaknesses in there, try to address them as, as, as soon as possible. Generate some data or just let go 
an aim because it's too weak uh, for his grant, but think ahead, right? So if you've checked all um, those points and you say, okay, let's go, I'm applying. Well, you start writing. And, um, and something I want everybody to keep in mind is, and again, you have to be extremely humble and, and be smart first, think first. I always think before working. So how can, as a researcher, how can I expect that my application will be selected if I don't know who I'm talking to, how it compares to others, uh, other applications and past applications, and if it's boring and full of holes, right? So if it's just a generic application that you didn't get at for organization A and you're just cop copy and pasting it for another uh, organization, the odds are very low, right? Because the reviewers might be different. Uh, it's not uh, the story necessarily you want to tell for that, uh, that organization. So think ahead. So um, just a brief way. That, there's many ways to write a grant. Um, I've been lucky to be fairly successful in, in, in securing grants. And this is roughly how I do it. Uh, I'm not going to go into details, but just the most important points. So my structure, again, for something like a CIHR, 8 to 10, page, uh, 10 pages grant, but this can also apply for scholarships or fellowships or even salary grants for, uh, for PIs. Um, I always write half a page first. Even if there's a scientific summary in the application, um, you, sometimes uh, reviewers will not read that. They will just tackle the whole application. So half a page, a teaser, summarizing the whole thing. Uh, it has to be clear and obvious what you want to do. You have to make the review the reviewer want to read your application. It has to pack a punch, right? You need to impress the reviewer within half a page, right? Keep in mind that, and I will talk about that later. Usually, re reviewers will score quickly, right? They will quickly get an idea of the bracket you're in, right? So the first half a page needs to pack a punch for sure and give a good impression right away. So you will start high and the only way you can go down. If it's, 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 it's much harder to, to be extremely high in the head of your reviewer and go lower as, as they read than, than go starting low. Climbing is, is pretty tough, right? So, uh, and then usually I go with what people will call the background section. Um, I, I prefer to say the problem to be addressed we're researchers, we're scientists, we're problem solvers. We love to hear about problems and find solutions, right? And as reviewers, we want to hear that the applicant has identified a problem and that they want to solve it, right? So that problem needs to be clear and instinctively leading to the hypothesis and objectives. You have to make the reviewer feel smart, right? If you think ahead and the way you're, you're, uh, you're uh, designing your, your problem to be addressed section um, and, it, and the reviewer would, would come to the same hypothesis and identify the same objectives, oh, that, that's two thumbs up, right? You, you, you did the right thing. Uh, and again, do not do a boring generic background section. Uh, too often we read, uh, COPD is a chronic lung disease caused by tobacco smoking, blah, 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 every time. So if you, the odds are that the reviewer just skipped that section, right? And, and maybe missed some information that you put in there, right? You want reviewers to read most of the sections. And again, usually reviewers get bored easily. I get bored easily when I review grants. I have to try to stay focused. So if I hit very generic sections, to me, I, I want action. So it, it sounds weird saying action, talking about a research grant, but there's a way that you can make a research grant extremely interesting to read the way you, uh, you design it. And, and usually just plainly talking about a disease is not, it's more talking about problems and, and things we don't know about that disease. So, um, so yeah. And again, a clear hypothesis and specific aims needs to be clear. Sometimes we read hypotheses and specific aims that, that we have to read three, four times. It's not clear. 
it's clear in your head, right? As the researcher, as the applicant. But again, you're another reviewer. So it needs to be clear for us as reviewers. So usually clearer is shorter, right? When there's less words, it's easier to understand the meaning um, without losing too much information, of course, but shorter is better, right? And usually there's more impact with that. And, and, and you'll see I'm, today, I'm not gonna talk much about the science, right? Um, again, and the, the experimental plan is extremely important, uh, of course, right? You wanna secure funding to do those experiments. So for each objective, at the right time, in the right place, you always have to tell why it's important, right? It's not all about what you'll be doing, but mainly because mainly about why you're doing it. I will be using cell culture and that kind of media um, uh, using this inhibitor, blah, blah, blah. To me, there's not the inform it's not the information I, I'm looking for. I'm looking for why you're using cell culture, for instance, right? I'm using cell culture or I will use this um, primary cell line because blah, 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 right? Now understand why you're doing this, right? And I'm able to judge, does that make sense or not? So uh, is this the right thing to do? And, and then of course, when there's why everywhere, the description of the experiments you wanna do, Providing a sprinkle of data is extremely important. It will show feasibility and it will show that you're heading the right way, right? So if you have a hypothesis and you already have data using uh, the technique you want to use uh, showing that this hypothesis makes sense, well, reviewers love that. This is the primary goal of preliminary data, showing you're heading the right way and that you can use the techniques you want to do, you want to use. And again, be clear, uh, it has to be easy to understand the whys and hows, um, not necessarily the what, right? So, and, and finally, talk about your team. It is so important, so important, and the expertise. So uh, leave room for that. Some grant applications will give you specific sections to talk about the expertise in your team, but make sure that if there's no specific space, that you uh, you talk about your team and expertise. This is part this is part of feasibility, right? And feasibility is extremely important. Um, again, just a few things. Um, a strain is very important. You have to show your strengths, right? Um, and a real strain, saying that, for instance, I'm the only researcher being able to do this. I have that. I've been doing this for a long time. I have the I have the expertise. Nobody else can do it. And this is the right thing to do. Um, this is a strength, right? And a strength is better than a weakness that's been addressed. For instance, that um, in the past decades, our lab has been using uh, immortalized cells. Now we've been using primary cells and we have preliminary data showing that we observe the same thing and blah, blah, blah. This is a, a weakness initially using immortalized cells that's now been addressed using primary cells. And this is better than an acknowledged weakness, which means that, okay, we are using immortalized cells. We know it's not the ideal model, in vitro model, but uh, blah, 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 and you try to defend yourself. You acknowledge the weakness, but you didn't fix anything. And this is much better than a whole, which means not addressing it at all. You propose to use immortalized cells, you don't even mention primary cells or that it would be interesting to use it. Um, so this is very bad. So make sure you can flag those things and address them very quickly because this sometimes could be a, a good way to, to transform a weakness into a strength. So in addressing uh, everything as you go, if you feel when you read, you reread your grant because your grant at this point has been pretty much advanced, you read it, and you feel that, that the reviewer might think that, okay, they've been using primary cells. There's a low, in the data they show they're, they're only got primary cells from three individuals, uh, three males, and this could be a weakness. You have to address that right away, not in the limitation section or the, 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 
the, the weakness section on things like this uh, right away. So we know that in the experiment shown, we only have three individual primary cells from two individuals, three males, but as uh, we will describe in M2, we are planning on increasing our N right away. You don't want those weaknesses to linger too long in the head of the, the reviewers. And of course, less is more. So focus on being clear and show feasibility. It is not time to show off with fancy techniques you don't master. Saying that you will be doing single cell RNA-seq in itself means nothing if you don't have the expertise or the collaborator or the experience to do it. You can actually be a weakness, right? And if it's something you really want to do, think ahead in the, 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 the reflection phase and make sure that you ally with the right researcher or collaborator or that you develop the expertise in house months before applying for the grant because this will be uh, this will be a weakness feasibility in grantmanship is a key it's essential and um, a sentence that i think summarizes a few things is that nobody wants to know the recipe for pbs in a grant phosphate buffered saline nobody wants to know that detail what they want to do is they want to know is they want to know why you make it that you may that you can make it actually and that you can use it to do great things don't get caught in technicalities in in in, in spending paragraphs explaining techniques that will not necessarily impact feasibility again tilly said it uh, a figure or a picture is worth a thousand words um to show feasibility, there's nothing like showing data, right? Just show data. You will save a whole paragraph and you'll be able to focus on the why uh, you are using that technique. And again, this is something I love to do, uh, to dress up, not myself, of course, but when I write grants, I, 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 I like them to be, to look good. I love them to look good. So use figures and tables, not just for data. If there's a complex protocol, you, you have a hard time to put down in words, or people have a hard time to understand when just reading it, just make a figure. Well, you, you'll be able to use it in, in your new future presentations, and people will be able to more easily grasp what you're going to, uh, going at with, with that protocol. So um, yeah, leave space between paragraphs. It's, I'm a scientist, I have a PhD, post like everything. And I'm talking about just a couple enters here and there. Leave space, right? Use subtitles, use shapes to emphasize things. Um, leave space for the, the reviewer to breathe, right? It is extremely important. If you give me a whole paragraph and I'll give you an example, a whole page, a single paragraph, a whole page, I just take it and I don't want to read it. I don't want to read it. It's too dense. There's it's, 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 it's not encouraging to read, but if you give me five paragraphs or three paragraphs, I love that, right? Small goals. Oh, I read a paragraph. I'm happy I got it. So uh, it's easier. So this is exactly the example. So personally, when I see that as a reviewer, as a person, um, I don't want to read it. It's not appealing. The only thing I see is background, which already sounds kind of a little boring and uh, to me, it, it's all the same. It's real gibberish. Well, it, it, it's gibberish, but it's, a, it's, it's not interesting. And if you say the same thing and do this, which turns something that it's, it's the same text, it's a bit longer. You have to sacrifice a couple of words for sure. But again, a disease that kills. Oh, it's appealing, right? Uh, a new solution. Oh, there's a problem. Oh, there's a solution. That's interesting couple paragraph emphasize some sentences. So, so you're sure that the reviewer at least will read the, 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 the text in bold and a, a nice figure that will help understanding the whole thing. This is much more interesting for me to read this than the whole thing. Because as an applicant, you can spend a lot of time tweaking those couple of sentences here. But if the reviewer gets bored here, and jumps here to, to find something interesting, it's very risky. They will not get the information there, or maybe they will just be scanning the whole thing, right? Don't think that all the reviewers will always read everything from top 
to bottom. They were looking for information, right? That will give them, give them an insight about what you wanna do. So a small, small paragraphs like this, usually when you start a small paragraph like this, you will get to the end. And at the end, there's a small paragraph like this, you will get to the end. So at the end, the reviewer will read the whole thing, right? So it's much more interesting and just by adding a couple of tweaks to, uh, to that. So food for thoughts, quickly. Um, thing I noticed uh, over the past years uh, about successful applications, um, applications that are not clear or not success successful or that are clear, applications that are clear are more likely to be successful. Uh, talking about the rationale, why you're doing your research, the methodology, does that, is it clear what you want to do? Does that make sense? Deliverable, deliverables, what, what's going to come out of this? Um, is, it, is it really clear or is it just general? We will increase knowledge. This is too general. Just, you have to be more specific and grounded. Uh, feasibility, is it clear? The CV, is it easy to read? Um, uh, your publication record, does it, is it easy to follow? Uh, is it easy to define your expertise when just looking at your publications? So uh, it has to be clear. Applications that are, I say boring, it's, it's not very a nice word, but honestly, I don't have a better one, um, but they're less likely to be selected. Sometimes you, you can easily read a text that is boring and you could easily tweak it and add a few things or change a few things to make it more dynamic, more, more fun to read. Um, and let's say that um, talking about asthma, so we know that um, uh, severe asthma has been primarily treated with steroids, but there's new pathways that were identified recently, and this led to new therapies, but these therapies are not well used by physicians or easy to use by physicians. How can we improve that N leading to the next? So a bit more dynamic, uh, just asking questions, writing questions like this and providing answers. Applications with, with questionable feasibility are not successful. If for a viewer, what you're proposing to do doesn't seem feasible, because it's too complicated or didn't understand properly, or you're proposing a bunch of techniques you don't have the expertise for, or there's no data uh, uh, that are, are supporting what you want to do, or there's no collaborator helping you on things that on paper you're not an expert on, um, honestly, uh, you will not get it. And uh, yeah, if there's more, there's more impact, uh, it's going to be easier. So um, reviewers, some of them are nice. They will find good and great things about your grants. Usually it's the older reviewers, they're much nicer. They know what it's been to be a researcher. And so they don't want to find good in your grants. And usually there's also some reviewers that will try to kill applications. The younger, uh, uh, the younger uh, researchers, they just um, are looking for flaws and weaknesses. Uh, we can be mean. I consider myself a, a more older reviewer now, but I've been a mean re reviewer in the past. So, uh, but yeah, you, you're exposed to that. Uh, reviewers will rapidly uh, get a feel of the score for your application. That's why you have to pack a punch and have a very good impact early on uh, when writing your grant. Matthew? Uh, sorry, yeah. we, oh, sorry, uh, going too yeah. long. Yes, thank oh, you. Sorry. sorry. So, yeah, I thought that. So, Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, we will move on. Uh, Dr. Stevenson has joined us. Anne, are you there? Yes. Hi. There you are. Hi. hi there. Um, can I share my screen? Eileen, is that okay? If I yes, if you'd like to. Slides? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. I just made a few more tweaks. So I think after, um, there we go. Is that fine? Yes, that looks great. Thank you. Okay, so as soon as this call is over, I'm going back to the grant that I'm currently writing and I'm taking all of these pieces of advice and going to apply them to, to the grant that is upcoming for me because I'm like, okay, yeah, that's a good point. Yes, that's a good point. So thanks for that. Um, Thank you for inviting me to talk today. Um, my name is Anne Stevenson. I'm a respirologist at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto and I'm a clinician scientist here. Um, 
And I was asked to talk about the transition from being a trainee to an independent researcher. And I think some of the people on the call are maybe early in their trainee experience. Other people might be later on and kind of thinking towards that transition. Um, and I just want to give you some tips and advice about how to make it as painless as possible and maybe even a little bit easy. So I'm going to start off with a bit about my own personal academic journey and then end with kind of eight key tips, some of which have actually been mentioned. So I'll probably go through those ones a bit faster. Um, they've already been mentioned on the call. Um, but some of these tips relate to grantsmanship um, and other are strategies that you can use to really kind of hit the ground running when you get that first academic appointment. So this is my academic journey. Um, and, you know, obviously, it's the, these processes are not always linear, right? You don't sort of follow the usual path. Although, when I did this, I kind of thought, well, this looks pretty linear, you know, like it kind of has checks all the boxes, right? I did my training, and then I was working a bit, and then I did my PhD and, and a postdoctoral fellowship, and I got my academic appointment. Um, but actually, it doesn't tell the entire story, um, because before I finished my respirology training, I was actually in the dermatology program. So I was going to be a dermatologist, sort of decided after doing internal medicine, I really liked it and switched into internal medicine. A lot of people thought I was crazy. Um, and now some days I sort of regret that because I'd probably have a lot more money, but um, I do love my job. So I'm happy where I am. Um, I then got a job as a clinical associate, which was nice because it allowed me to kind of get a feel of what work was like. Do I want to do academic medicine? Do I want to do um, uh, community medicine? And I thought I would do that for a while, but um, it was 10 years later when I actually decided to do the next phase of my, of my career, which, you know, well, I, I sort of started a little earlier than 10 years, but I was a clinical associate for 10 years. So people thought I was never going to get an academic appointment. Um, the PhD sort of started off as a master's and then switched into the PhD program and I applied for a couple of uh, studentships and scholarships along the way which helped support the salary while I was doing that. And then um, I never even really thought of a postdoctoral fellowship until a friend of mine came up and, and said, oh, there's somebody who has a CIHR grant and within that there is a postdoctoral fellowship fund, so you should speak to them. So I did do that um, and got that first postdoctoral fellowship. Again, I thought it would be a year and it ended up being a couple of years. Um, but in my at the, towards the end of that fellowship training, I applied um, for a CIHR operating grant, really not thinking that I would get it because everyone told me it's impossible and, you know, the success rate is so, so low. Um, but lo and behold, I ended up getting the CIHR operating grant and I actually had to end my postdoctoral fellowship a year early because I couldn't hold the fellowship and also have an academic appointment. So, um, I decided getting the grant and starting my academic career was probably the best way to go. So I, I moved on to do that. And then since then, you know, yeah, it looks like, oh, yeah, you got grants and your co investigators and PIs on grants, but there's been lots of rejections along the way. So the process has not been sort of a linear trend upwards. It's been like it started off, I, I think it was like beginner's luck. I got the CIHR operating grant and then, you know, tons of rejection. So all that to say that you guys, you know, um, I think really need to be open to opportunities that come up along the way. And this whole process, I think, allowed me the time to lay the foundation for um, making it a bit easier to actually start in academics. Now, Tip number one is just that. That leads me into laying the foundation for your future success. And the, the taking the necessary time for training is extremely important. And when I talk to other people about it, I always get the sense like people are dying to get finished. You know, it's like, I want to be done. I want to start working and making money, which is certainly, you know, nice having a career and that, that part is good. Um, but taking the necessary time will increase the probability of success later on and will allow you to actually be ready and, and hit the ground running when you get that first academic appointment. Because remember, once you get that academic appointment, you actually, the clock starts ticking. And then you are waiting for your three-year review. And, you know, 
in order to pass that three-year review, you, you have to, you know, um, achieve certain milestones. So if you hit the ground running, you've achieved those milestones, no problem, right away almost. And so your three-year review is, is not a problem. Um, furthermore, when you're a trainee, like, you know, it's, it's nice because you have support, you have, it's a place where you can make mistakes, you have someone advising you actively. Um, and so instead of waiting and, and rushing to get that academic appointment where you're kind of, you're not on your own, but you don't have the same sort of environment that you can go to people necessarily, um, really take that opportunity to, to, um, you know, appreciate the advice that you can get during that time. And during those years, also, you can get publications. So you get publications from your thesis, or you apply for salary support awards and other awards, travel awards, those sorts of things. All of those things leading up to that first um, grant and that first academic appointment is um, makes it so much easier because your CV is packed with a bunch of really solid things. Um, and so it's it's a much easier transition uh, to to being um, a full full time faculty. Tip number two, look for opportunities. I think it's come across already in this pre these presentations that writing is really important. And I think people don't necessarily take the time to learn how to be a good writer. Um, and when you're a trainee, that is a perfect opportunity to um, write things, to critique writing. And how do you do that? Well, you can ask your supervisors, do they have any opportunities to review manuscripts for journals, for example? So I'm an associate editor at the Journal of Cystic Fibrosis. I get, you know, submissions all the time. So I need reviewers. And I always try to make sure that the trainees have an opportunity under my supervision to, to review a manuscript, because that will... Um, make you see what is a good manuscript, what's clear writing, and what is not. And, and you know, we're always looking for reviewers, right? It's hard to, uh, you kind of have your pool of people you go to all the time, but we need new people and new academic people that are coming up are a great pool of resources for people who should learn how to do it. And, and it's amazing to me when I ask people to review even more senior people, they don't really know how to do it often. So take the opportunity to ask your supervisors or other colleagues, are, can you review any manuscripts uh, with their guidance or internal reviews? Again, this just improves your own writing. It shows, you know, you're active in terms of leadership role. Um, you have determination and dedication. It's good for your CV. So all of those things kind of are, are great opportunities. So I would actively seek those out. Um, tip number three, know your audience. So as has been mentioned before, the fellowship application, and I think Stephen is going to go through a little bit more detail about the different pieces of the application. But this is really more focused on your training, your future goals. Um, it's less more less important the actual project, but it's more the research environment and what you hope to, to gain the training that you hope to gain to, to make you successful in the future. When you're making that application to um, a granting body as an independent researcher, the expectations are a little bit higher and they're focused a little bit more on you and your team. And can you actually carry out this project? The, the uh, project itself is weighted much more heavily and it needs to be clinically relevant, clear and impactful. And you need to communicate that across to your audience. Um, also for salary support awards. So when you're starting off as a new, as a new academic person, um, there are um, early career investigator awards, which are salary support awards. Take the opportunity to apply for as many of those as you possibly can, because once that window of time passes, you're no longer considered an uh, early career investigator, then it's it's harder to find opportunities for salary support. So take that that initial stage of your career um, to apply for as many of those as you can, and also learn how to toot your own horn. Like it's it is sort of um, a skill to know how to write something to really highlight your research program and also you and what you've accomplished and um, 
it's, it's hard, I think, for people to do that often. I know that that was a bit of a challenge I found. Um, but then once I was able to do that, I, I sort of read it over and thought, wow, you know, I've done a lot of things. Like the, there's a lot of impacts that I've had across different areas. And it's nice to sort of, sort of see that summarized. And then somebody reviewing that can say, wow, this person is really solid. And, and I think that they're going to, um, you know, have a lot of successes in the future. So you're more likely to get that early career award. But you can't kind of, you know, play down your accomplishments. This is a time for you to really say how, how great you are. Uh, tip number four, don't recreate the wheel. Um, don't start like I personally found it extremely helpful to speak to previous successful candidates, either for operating grants, salary support awards, um, anything really, because just seeing how people format things, the types of figures people use, um, you know, I'm not saying copy them, but you can kind of think, oh, that's a great way to, to display that information in a figure. I never thought of how to do that. Or, you know, that's a really good Gantt chart that will show the accomplishments across the three years of this grant, you know, what the milestones are going to be. And not just for grants and, and grant applications, but really for CVs. Um, I, I don't know about you guys, but I mean, I would just start off with my CV and, and of course you put, you know, salary support awards, publications, that was kind of obvious. But it wasn't until I saw other more senior people's CVs that I realized there was a lot of other components that I could put in that in my CV that I never would have thought to include had I not had that as an example. You know, um, administrative roles, uh, roles of leadership outside of your, your direct research program, things like that. And, and it's nice to see uh, examples of those because I'm sure there's a lot of things that you guys can, could include in there that you just haven't really thought of. Tip number five, um, this was mentioned by Mathieu, like make your applications look professional, okay? As soon as I read a, a manuscript for a journal or review a grant for an agency, as soon as I see it, I swear if it's, if it's no formatting, it's like um, it was mentioned, a big block of text, it's just, I don't even wanna move on. It's just like, I know it's not gonna be good. But if I see a, a grant or an application or a manuscript that has nice subheadings, it's nicely formatted, there's different pieces to it, it's not, um, you know, there, there's uh, figures and tables and stuff like that, right away I think this person knows what they're doing. The other thing is uh, typos and grammatical errors. I cannot stress enough how important it is to make sure those are not in these applications. If I again, read something and I find that there's a bunch of typos, automatically, I think it, it just affects the perception of the grant, even though it might be the best study, you know, next to whatever. It's, it, it doesn't matter. Those things just reflect poorly. And I really are so, are so um, not necessary and fixable that you really need to take time to make sure that those are not, not there. Tip number six, uh, listen to reviewers' comments. So this also was mentioned in a couple of the previous presentations, but, you know, there's a lot of ways that you can get comments, um, either by an internal review. So when we apply for grants at St. Mike's, we have to have an internal review first by two people at least, and then it will get feedback from that, and then you can then move on to submit the grant. So if you have that process, take advantage of it so that you can get people and, and choose people that are scientists, but not necessarily in your field directly, because you want people who don't know the, the content that well to be able to make sure that it's written clearly enough that they understand what you're going to do. And it's, it's easy to make assumptions if you ask people, like I'm a CF re researcher, if I ask all of my CF colleagues to read my grants, they already know what CF is about and the important things. But somebody reviewing the grant might not know much about CF. So I, I should get people outside of the cystic fibrosis uh, arena to give me feedback on those things. Um, again, 
take time to digest the feedback. It's always a bit disheartening when I, you think you have a fantastic grant, you go to the internal review, and I leave thinking, forget it. I am just not even going to apply. I'm going home to have three glasses of wine, and I'm just not even going to do academic medicine. Usually, that sort of takes me 24 hours, maybe 48, depending on how bad the reviews are. Um, but I come back and I read them over again, I just kind of take them one by one. And sometimes there are review co reviewer comments that are not necessarily useful. So I kind of, you know, sift out what's useful and what isn't and incorporate the feedback um, as much as possible. I, I also recommend this not only for grants, but when you're writing manuscripts and you get reviewer feedback from manuscripts as well, it's the same thing. Initially, you sort of feel like, oh gosh, I'm never going to be able to address all of these issues. But then you just, you know, take one bite out of it at a time, you address all the points and you usually that means that the grant or the manuscript is better. So don't give up. You definitely can do this. We all kind of go through this mental, um, uh, these mental gymnastics every time. Tip number seven is create a strong team around you. So as an independent researcher, you really can't do this alone. So you're not going to apply as an independent researcher and you're the only person person on this grant, right? You need to engage people around you to help you be successful. You need to make sure there's somebody on the grant that has expertise in the different areas, as was previously mentioned, so that when someone's reviewing it, they can say, oh, yes, the PI has expertise in this, but they've also got a statistician on the application. They've got someone who's previously done health services research, and this is what this grant is about. So they've got that covered. You know, make sure that the appropriate people are on the grants. Um, you have to separate yourself a bit from your supervisors, from your previous supervisors, because you don't want to start off your academic career thinking that you are associated you are still just a trainee under your supervisor. So you want to try to break free of that, but, but still create a, a strong team around you that can build your own program. Um, I mentioned already about the early career awards. Um, I would also say that I think that a lot of institutions now have mentorship programs. So hopefully, um, and obviously during your training, you would have, will have developed some mentors, um, but lean on them, ask them for examples, ask for their CVs, ask for previous applications and, and ask them to read your grants because um, they've been through it already. They know exactly what the process is and they can give you their own tips and, and advice. All right, Dr. Stevens, and this is the last tip. Yep. Last yes, tip. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and the last thing is just, again, this has been uh, mentioned before, but make it easy for the grant reviewer. They're busy. They're not being paid extra extra for doing this. They just want to be able to be engaged and read and uh, understand uh, the, the application. So make sure everything is logical and flows properly. And there's not a lot of repetition throughout throughout the grant. So that is it. The summary is just enjoy your training, but take time to lay the foundation. If you do, it'll make that transition into an academic sort of um, appointment very easy. Um, and just try to be prepared, persistent, and patient, and you will have success. And I will answer questions after if there are any. Thank you, Dr. Stevenson. Um, we're going to switch over to uh, Dr. Wright. There. Eileen, I'm going to have to go. I'm sorry I'm on service, so I won't get to my talk, okay? But Thank you very much for popping off. in. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Thanks. Bye. All right. Thanks very much for having me. Um, so, yeah, my name is Steve. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of British Columbia. And in my section, I'm going to focus on some nuts and bolts of training applications and how we can align them for success. And I'm going to speak to this from my experience as a grad student, my experience as a mentor for undergraduate and graduate students, and with input from a friend of mine who is a reviewer for the CIHR doctoral awards. So I began my master's with no studentship application or studentship awards. And over my PhD, I was able to grow from an institutional studentship, to several provincial uh, awards, and then finally was offered and accepted a Canadian Lung Association scholarship. So 
then I was fortunate to uh, begin my postdoctoral fellowship with funding from the Canadian Respiratory Research Network, Michael Smith Health Research BC, and then this year I was awarded a CIHR fellowship. In the interest of transparency, over the last 10 years, I've probably been rejected in over half of my applications. Um, but I think that funding success tends to snowball, and so here we're trying to accelerate doors. So I have three key concepts that I want to focus on as we go through this. And the first is to align your application and articulate the relevance. The second is to answer so what up front and highlight the novelty and impact of your work. And the third is to speak explicitly and provide examples and evidence throughout. So before I get into the nuts and bolts of it, I just want to touch on a few ways to maximize your chances of being successful. So first, apply for pretty much everything. There's a lot of opportunities for trainees in our areas. And although the success rates of any given application are modest, we apply for more of them, we have a better chance of becoming successful. That builds your track record. Second, know what's being funded. So funding agencies are on missions and many of them will have strategic research plans. And you can find these and read them to understand what they're focused on and then make it clear how your work contributes to what they're trying to achieve. And taking a step further, we can leverage what reviewers are going to look for. So we can read the application instructions and find reviewers' evaluation criteria online and then speak directly to these points and provide evidence for them in our applications. So the nomenclature that different applications will use may differ, but in general, there are three key points are project summary, personal statement, and your references. I think it's important to make sure that these these important components have alignment between them. They tell a clear and coherent story as your application comes together. So beginning with the project summary, we want to touch on what we're going to do, but we also want to highlight why it's novel and important to make it clear what our role is going to be in a bigger project, especially. Remember, this isn't a comprehensive literature review, and it's not a detailed protocol. You don't need to cram in um, everything you know and every fancy technique that you're going to employ. It's unlikely that a reviewer is going to be an expert in your field as the previous speakers have touched on. So we want to strike a delicate balance between keeping it simple enough that a non-expert reviewer can understand what you're doing and why it's important and feel good about themselves, but also accurate enough that if an expert in your field does get it, they believe you know what you're talking about and that you can do what you say. So in my Project summaries, I tend to spend about a third on the background and rationale, third on the design and methods, and then save about a third to highlight the project's impact and my role. In it. So the first chunk is usually going to be the background and rationale. I apologize to Matthew for using that term. But we want to touch on not only what's known, but also what is not known on the topic, because this is the knowledge or practice gap that our work is going to try to fill. And from there, we want to build very concise rationale so that by reading only what's on the paper, not what's in your head, it becomes clear what the knowledge gap is, and then basically obvious to the reviewer what the hypothesis should be. So I like to state that somewhere clearly in one line on the first page. It's easy for reviewers to refer to, and then the rest of it covers the methods. Again, it's a summary. So I like to touch on what the study design approach is, what population we're studying in our sample sizes, an intervention if there is one. We want to make it clear what our primary endpoint is and a couple secondary ones, maybe. We want to make it clear that the ways that we're going to assess these endpoints are the best way possible to do it. And also that our project's going to be feasible within the time frame of our graduate training. You have to finish it before you defend. So I think it's important in these project summaries to really articulate the impact because this is really what the funder's return is going to be for investing their money. So I like to start off by having the scope of the problem because this should grab the reviewer's attention and say, hey, look, this is a big deal that you should care about and hook them in. Now, impact for training awards can come in a number of different and valuable ways. So maybe your um, project is going to reduce acute exacerbations for COP, which is a top reason for hospitalization in Canada. So something like this, I usually like to slot in at the end of the first third rather than the end because Basically, the idea is you say, look, here's the problem. Here's what we know, and here's what we don't know. Here's how we think we can address it. And if we can, here's the impact that we could have. 
Now, let me show you how we're going to achieve that goal. It's also important to note that your own development is an important and impactful outcome here because by getting this training and by doing this project, you're going to become a health researcher that's successful in Canada and that aligns with some of the CIHR and ICR agency priorities. So summarize your role in the project, make clear what you're going to do and not do. And you can be succinct and then elaborate on exactly what you're going to do and the techniques you're going to use later on in your personal summary and your personal statement. So I think it's really important to incorporate and consider sex and gender in our research. And I really encourage trainees to invest time in learning how to do this because I think it's an area with a lot of work to be done and that creates a lot of opportunities for novel and impactful work. So some applications will have an SGBA statement or attachment, and if not, I suggest including a short statement somewhere or interspersing words along your project summary. And when you do this, I really suggest you not avoid or try not to defend why SGBA does not apply to your project, but rather think about at each step of the research process, how could SGBA apply and how can you consider it? We don't necessarily need to focus or power every study to detect significant differences based on these factors, but I think it's important that if we consider it meaningfully, assess it, and present it in some uh, form, it moves the ball forward and it allows your research to be used in things like meta-analyses and inform future work by yourself or others. So moving on to the personal statement, um, I challenge my trainees to not just use this as a way to elaborate on the specific research skills and techniques they're going to learn, but really express how this training experience and this program is going to develop them into a successful researcher. So I usually start off with my specific career goal in two or three lines at the top. And then the rest of this is just creating the trajectory that shows where I've come from and how I'm going to get. So in the first part of the personal statement, I usually try to summarize what experiences have provide, uh, prepared us for success. And if we look at reviewer criteria that are available, we see that there's a lot of different areas that they want us to touch on. And some of the previous speakers have highlighted it really nicely. We can also use this section to highlight significant contributions that we've made if we have them, as well as highlight recognitions that we've received. So say you've done undergraduate research project or finished your master's thesis, in a few lines, you can touch on what you focused on, some of the important skills that you gained from that and how they relate to your current and future training, what you've contributed from that work and any recognitions you received. And you can do this in just a few lines and it calls out stuff that you're going to include in your CV and reinforces that. We then want to discuss how our experience in the project and program we're proposing is going to develop you into a well-rounded and successful researcher. So if there isn't a separate attachment for training choice, I suggest using two or three lines to highlight why this is the ideal location for you to continue your training and discuss why your location in your lab and your institution and your new research focus complements your previous work and advances you towards your career goal. The rest of this attachment, I usually spend working through a number of clear, concise subheadings, and I pick out things that I think are important aspects of becoming a successful researcher. Well, I'll note that what you choose to focus on will depend a little bit on what career stage you're at and what your goal ultimately is. So we want to make the most of our references. They're an important part of all of our applications, and we can help them help us. So we want to have people be our sponsors who have had a good opportunity to assess what we've got and what our potential is. We don't necessarily need always the most distinguished name that we can find. We want at least one sponsor who really knows you well and is most likely to give you a detailed and positive reference and submit it on time. So I know early in my training, um, I didn't have very many mentors who knew me very well and knew me, my experiences. So what I would do craft was a sponsor package each year, and I would include in this my current CV so people know what I had done, a draft of my project summary so people would know what I'm focusing on, and one to two pages of the subheadings I've mentioned previously, each with two or three bullet point examples so that when sponsors write their letters, they can pull from this document and provide specific tangible examples um, to substantiate the points and hopefully the positive comments that they're writing about. 
I'm going to wrap it up here now. Um, I think my application became a lot stronger and started to increase my success rates when I began paying careful attention to alignment. And this comes in a couple of different ways. So the first is that your application should align with what's being funded. Think back to earlier, the reviewers, um, the funding agencies are going to be on a mission. Competition will have aims and objectives. And we want to make it clear in these documents how they align with what the agency is trying to achieve. And we can state that explicitly in these components. So it's obvious for the reviewer that we understand what they're trying to accomplish and that we're on board and they're going to invest in success. The second way is across the personal sum or the project summary, personal statement, and the reference letters. And I use these to try and tell a coherent story. So rather than each of these being a tick box and I need to finish up writing so that I can submit my application, you should tell a coherent and complementary story from a number of different perspectives about my project, my training trajectory, and my goal. And so I think by focusing on alignment in your application, you can craft one that really re represents you holistically, shows you how you're going to contribute to lung health in Canada, and ultimately makes a good case that you're exactly the kind of candidate that should be supported in your training. Thank you. That's it for me, and happy to take part in question box. Great. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, I, I realize that we are a bit short on time, uh, but uh, Dr. Cole has some very important uh, points coming with uh, upcoming funding opportunities and possible trading opportunities that CIHR sponsors that would be beneficial to um, everybody in the future. So, uh, Dr. Cole, I'd like to pass it on to you. Sure, great. Thanks, Eileen. So I'm going to speak really quick. The slides will be circulated. So there are a bunch of hyperlinks and information in there that I'm just going to really gloss gloss over for now. Um, I can share. Actually, Eileen, could you bring the slides up? Sure. Yeah. Thanks. So um, just before we get started, I'll acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from Treaty 6 territory. So I'm actually based in Edmonton, Alberta at the University of Alberta. And so that is the home of many First Nations and Métis people. So at CHR and ICRH, we do strive, um, we do strive to engage Indigenous people and, and their cultures for respectful partnerships. Um, and so that, that's through listening and, and, and learning as we search for and, and establish true reconciliation. So next slide, please. And then you can skip to the next one. So just uh, briefly, CHR did recently release their strategic plan, not in 2022, but in 2021. And one of the priorities outlined was to strengthen Canada's health research capacity. Next slide, please. So the this spawned an action plan on training. So of course, the main focus of this action plan is health research, as we are a funding uh, organization of health research. However, it has gone beyond the health research enterprise. And that's because CHR has identified a number of challenges which are shown here, and that and addressing those challenges will hopefully um, make trainees that are leaders of tomorrow across knowledge sectors, re recognizing that not everyone goes the academic tra trajectory, and of course that are experts in critical areas, and that was highlighted by the pandemic, but it certainly existed uh, before then. So next slide, please. So if we can just maybe next slide, next slide, yeah. Next slide, please, Eileen, thank you. So. This is kind of the bread and butter of CIHR. I think everyone's super familiar with um, the CGS doctoral and master's program. So there are some things that I just really wanna quickly highlight in here. So you can see there are webinars that um, are available um, and uh, the 2022 ones are done, but the 2023 will be coming up and those will outline the details of a lot of these programs. So those are super helpful uh, to, to know about. Of course, uh, one thing I also want to highlight is that the master's and doctorals award, if you hold one of those, you can apply for a foreign foreign uh, study supplement. So that's an additional $6,000. And you can use that as a um, meal allowance, um, you know, uh, transportation, housing, that kind of thing. Most people don't know about that. So it, it, it's really important to, to know that that's there. Of course, we know about the CHR fellowship program and Banting postdoctoral fellowships. Of course, pay attention to the deadlines at your institution. A lot of institutions have internal deadlines um, and that's to get signature from RSO and that kind of thing. So really pay attention to those. So next slide, please. Um, 
some hidden things on the CHR website. And this will really speak to a lot of things that Dr. Hackett talked about, um, your individual development plan. If you work on one of those with your supervisor, I know a lot of grad studies mandate them, but if you work on those, you'll kind of have a head start in developing some of your grant applications and, and speaking to those things. So really important to explore those resources. And there's a number of modules as well on the CHR website covering lots of different facets of health research. Really valuable to watch some of those in your own time or participate complete some of the resources. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk about the Institute. So the CHR has a distributed model where the Institutes are all across Canada. Like I said, we're under the leadership of Dr. Brian Rowe, who is an emergency physician and um, uh, professor of public health at the University of Alberta. So we're located in Edmonton on Treaty 6. So next slide. So again, the institutes have a little bit more um, flexibility in how they can address uh, training activities. So this is not an exhaustive list, but there's networking opportunities with that some of the institutes offer, whether that's through the summer or a specific network that that trainees can engage with. Um, there's a leadership opportunity. Um, I uh, I won't talk about it in detail, but it's it's really interesting to visit this website talking about the Youth Advisory Council out of ITSE. You don't have to be in human development and child youth health research. You just have to be a youth between 12 and 25. And so by participating in that advisory committee, you get experience working with institute staff. You get to work with others, um, other youths and talk about really important um, health matters in your communities. We also go to the Youth Advisory Board for our needs of our institute if we want feedback on capacity development, for example. And of course, there's prizes as well. Um, and those are important too, um, because you want to reflect those in your grant applications and your award applications. So be on the lookout for those poster prizes and travel awards. Next slide. Sorry, I'm going really fast. So the Institute uh, Community Support Travel Awards, they're currently on hold. So this is run centrally, but all the institutes do participate in them. And so they have different requirements and research areas that they're interested in, um, different funding levels. And there's two launches a year. Right now, because they are on hold centrally, the institutes are launching their own, we call them off cycle. And so if you visit the institute websites, um, you may find that they're offering these travel awards on their own. And so it's really important to pay attention to that. Next slide, please. Next slide. So we launched our strategic plan earlier this year and uh, we work alongside partners. So our mandate is partnerships for better health. And so we work with CLA, CF Canada to meet our shared goals of preparing future capacity. So again, this was talked about by the other speakers, but we do have in this picture, we have the trainees all starting out at the same point, recognizing that everyone has intersecting identities. And so that start point may be different. We have a messy path in, in the middle and different endpoints. So we do acknowledge that it is not a straight line. It is not linear. And there's multiple endpoints for those who receive um, research training. So whether that's industry, pharma, government, or the traditional academic path. Next slide, please. So to, um, to fulfill this, we do have a number of funding approaches and I, I, I won't speak to those. What I will speak to is our partner training workshops. So these are embedded um, in national conferences and they're partnered with, um, with various, various societies and charities in our mandate area. And we offer these workshops to trainees, postdoctoral fellows, new investigators, and we focus on obviously research skills, peer review, grant writing, um, a lot of the same topics that we've had in this session, but also things like communicating to the media and we have health policy makers come and guest speak, job, job talks and their presentations, breakout sessions, networking opportunities. So it's not just didactic lectures. Next slide, please. So you can get involved by joining the planning committee. So although we're investing and we do have a hand in planning this, join that committee. It's great to put on your CV. It's great to put in a, in a, uh, in a, an award application and it's, um, it's also a great experience and you get to dictate what is happening at that conference and what you need to learn. So join those committees. Also, of course, apply for those travel and registration um, awards that we talked about. Next slide, please. So today, I know we've all talked about this. Today is the deadline for the CLA Studentship and Fellowship Award. So run, go apply. The registration is shortish. You're running, at, it's noon you know, half past 12 here in, in, in Edmonton. So it's a little later out East. Um, and I just wanna highlight two other things from our Institute. 
and that is um, the priority announcements in the doctoral and fellowship awards. So if you are applying to those upcoming doctoral and fellowship um, awards that we spoke about in the earlier slides, we have priority announcements. So if your research aligns with our mandate area, which is quite broad um, in circulatory and respiratory health, and you are highly ranked, but you miss out in that competitive funding, if you have checked off and filled in the relevance reform uh, form for our institute, you may get picked up for funding by our institute. So it's really important. So take a look at that because it is a, is a highly competitive, the, the general competition. So it's, it's really good if you are relevant to this to put your name in for consideration. Next slide, please. So that was a lot of information in <laughs> four or five minutes. Um, if you... If you want this information first, the best thing to do is to sign up for our newsletter. So I, I have the screenshot here. Go to those institutes. The 13 are listed there. See what's of interest to you and sign up for the newsletters. I have the link to our newsletter at the bottom. Our comms lead is really on the ball and she's really great at um, communicating all these upcoming events. So it's, it's an activity, so it's really important. Of course, the CIHR Access Newsletter to learn more about those kind of big ticket items at CIHR. And um, CHR does not have a TikTok, but they do have a Twitter. So you can follow them on Twitter where they're pretty pretty active. And you can also follow our institute on, um, on Twitter. And I know our comms lead is, is quite active on there and making sure that all of our activities get out to the community. So I think that's it. So thank you. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, it, it looks like we're, we're a little late and don't have much time for questions, but what I'll do is... I'll just step in there. Um, so I, can, I can type in slides in the slide and I've done that for a couple already. Yeah, just to reiterate, if anybody has any questions, we'll leave Slido open um, and you can submit your questions there and we can answer them. Uh, we have answered a few of the ones that have come up already. Um, and if there's a specific question you'd like to direct uh, to a speaker, you've been given the contact information. Again, I would like to thank everybody, uh, especially our speakers who have uh, given up valuable time on a Friday. I'd like to thank everybody who registered for today's workshop uh, for coming in um, and, and joining this. I hope you're able to take uh, some valuable information away on your future applications. And I wish everybody a great weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.